to <clears throat> three or four, five or six, maybe eight, okay, psychologists to try to get a diagnosis. <laughs> I was on a mission. I figured that I was probably paranoid, schizophrenic, delusional, and fantasy prone. <laughs> I just needed a doctor to put his approval on that diagnosis, tell me and to agree with me on that, but none of them would. So I quit going. And then something happened that I was totally unprepared for. I started getting memories and flashbacks of other encounters. And they were coming fast and furious, and they were exploding in my mind. And I couldn't believe it, all the things that had happened to me that I had done, just like the episode when I was 17, I had just turned away and not looked at it. I mean, I had a lot of shame about some of that. There were, there were some big things that had happened in my life and I just never even questioned it. Never looked at it. The marks on my body, an eight-hour abduction one day, all kinds of things. All kinds of times when I had disappeared. I was struggling to come to terms with that when I came to the realization that I was being abducted in real time. This was 1988. They were coming for me, and I couldn't deny it any longer. The fingerprints were on my arms, my forearms, almost constantly. I was aware of it. They were teaching me things. I was spending so much time with them, there was no denying it. And it, they were unrelenting, two and three and four and five times a week. A lot of the encounters were during the day. And I know that the reason they do that is because it's less fearful for me, but because I had to spend so much time for them, they were coming at night. Every Friday night, like clockwork. Every Friday night, you could count on them. You know how hard it is to go to bed when you know that an alien is coming for you? I was at the end of my rope when I got even worse news, and that was that they were taking my daughter. That's when things got really tough, and everything went to hell in a handbasket. I was angry, and I headed out with Dad, and I insisted that he leave us alone, leave my daughter alone. I bargained, I did everything I could. There were rough days. I went through a lot of fear. And there came a time when Da said to me, one day when I was sitting on the steps, and I had dropped my head into my hands, I tried killing myself. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me kill myself. I thought if I killed myself that it would keep my daughter safe. And I heard him say to me, Sherry, what can we do for you? And my head popped up, and I said, what? And he said, what can you do to comfort me? And I thought, what is this? This is something new. And so I asked, and I said, I thought about it for a while, and I asked them to show themselves to my meditation group, my support group, people who had been giving me the support that I needed. And when they did show themselves to each and every one of those people, and my best friend Vicki also. It meant the world to me, and it changed everything. And I started to look at things differently. And I thought about the things they were teaching me. They taught me how to be a light reader. And I thought, why would they teach me to be a light reader? That is to read the vibration of people because they told me that the earth was going to be going through some changes and that Gaia was going to be moving into the higher vibrations, the higher frequencies, and only those on her who resonated with that frequency would be going with her. Those who did not would be taken to another planet, another three-dimensional planet, to continue on their journey. And he said, there's no judgment in this, Sherry. All will get there eventually. There's no judgment. They talked about the Creator all the time. 
they taught me the three important things to know. The number one of which is we are all one with our creator. He would get frustrated almost. They don't really show that, but there, there were times when I would sense that he was somewhat frustrated with humanity, that we couldn't just get that, that we are all one with our creator. And they started teaching me that when I was really little. And then they would give me examples and downloads. So I started to reflect on the things they had taught me. And I wondered how it is that they could be evil. How is it that they could be the, the malevolent people that the investigators believed them to be and were telling me? And that was a story everywhere I went. When Don was done investigating me, I went off to conferences. I tried to read some books, and I still don't read books to this day. I don't want to taint my own awareness and my own level of knowingness that I have with my guys. So it was a long journey. And in 1990, end of 89, they stopped coming around. That series of abductions, as you want to call them, or encounters, what I call them, had subsided. And I was really, really grateful for a little while. Then I found myself missing them. I thought that was really sick. I had been begging them to leave me alone, leave my child alone. And when they did, I missed them. I didn't understand that. Excuse me one second. So I, I called out to them. I sent a message out. And I felt abandoned. And that's when I looked at the Stockholm Syndrome thing for a while. I thought maybe that's what was going on with me. Somebody had mentioned it to me. And so I looked at that, but no, I had decided that they were benevolent. It was just my fear of the way they looked. It was my fear that I'd been programmed to respond to them in a fearful way, because having them come in in the middle of the night, especially when I was a young child, it was frightening. They're scared looking, unfortunately. So it was just a visceral type response to them. The truth of it is, is that when I was with them, they're so loving, they're so benevolent, they're so gentle, and it's where I would choose to be. 